I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Today we're telling a story of siblings born and bred to run the world. They were the most infamous family of the 20th century. Their story drips with conspiracy. Their names whispered through the decades since they left their voices echoing in time and space. Their hands helped mold the America we know, sharing with their country dreams of landing on the moon, freedom for every man. And by example, they inspired generations to reach the highest heights. They played with fire, and only a few survived. Their words ring through our history books, their pretty faces on our television screens, and their signature will forever be stamped on our national identity. They stood in the trenches. We stood beside them. They flashed their diamonds. We flashed our cameras. They had their fun, and we saluted them. They were good. They were evil. They were human. They are the Kennedy siblings. On Tuesday, November 8th, 1960, While Jack was still sleeping, the rest of the Kennedy family was wide awake, silent, and on the edge of their seats. According to Jackie, it was the longest night in history. It was the night of the presidential election, and Bobby had the campaign headquarters set up in Ethel's stately but cozy living room. The kids slept soundly on the other side of the wall, but in the temporary headquarters, thumbtacks held papers with black ink and red pin marks on the walls, Stacks of loose papers cluttered the floor. A dozen half-drink coffee mugs sat on every surface available. All sleeves were rolled up, and in the background, the TV screamed. It was 9 a.m. They had been here all night, and they still didn't know for sure whether their brother was the next president of the United States or whether their best efforts hadn't been enough. You could cut the air with a knife. Earlier that evening, the atmosphere had been electric. Jack and Bobby sat quietly, gritting their teeth. Bobby wringing his hands, leaning forward, resting his elbows on his knees. Jack leaned back, one hand on his chin, the other arm stretched across the back of the couch. Both stared intently at the glowing TV. Jackie sat poised and silent next to Jack. When the first set of results came out, Eunice, Pat, and Jean were almost manic, Rushing around the house, giggling quietly, Jackie exclaimed, Oh, Bunny, you're president now. Jack shot them all down with his learned skepticism. No, no, it's too early. In reality, none of them except for Eunice knew much about what it all meant. This world of politics. As the hours ticked by, the votes came in, and the race got closer and closer. Jack was losing his gap. Around 3 a.m., he couldn't see straight anymore. He had given the election every ounce of himself, and now there was nothing left to do but pray and wait. So Jack made his peace with whatever he would face the next morning and went to bed. Pat sent him off with, Good night, Mr. President. They didn't know what to think. They didn't know what would happen. But they had all worked for years given their blood, sweat, and tears for this, and they believed in their big brother. We unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of childhood, a dimension of memory, a dimension parallel to the one you know. You're moving into a land of times past but not forgotten. You've just crossed over into the second generation of the Kennedy siblings. We're in Brookline, Massachusetts, The year is 1921. It's a scorching July day, and though it's just been a year since Kick was born, the clocks have speeded up. Time has started over. It's the same parents, and just a year later. But Eunice was born into another generation, another universe. 
1924, Pat joined her. Before Bobby in November of 1925, Jean in 1928, and Teddy in 1932. Okay, you're saying it's a new generation, so how old are Jack and Joe Jr. at this point? By the time Teddy was born, Joe Jr. was 17, Jack was 15. Hence the new generation. Eunice, our second firstborn, actually fifth in line. Just for clarification, there's like no new parents, no new anything. (laughs) I had heard this in some of my family study courses in college, but they say that every fourth kid, well, every four kids, so the fifth kid, the birth order like stereotype starts over. We feel like that's definitely true for the Kennedys, just with their personalities and the different... The roles that they played in the family. Yeah. So Eunice was like Jack in the fact that she was so sick as a kid. She wasn't quite as sickly as Jack was, but as Rose remembers, quote, Eunice, who was not very strong, went to a day school in Bronxville and came home for her meals, a necessity in her case, on account of her low weight. Later, when at boarding school, Rose would take a chauffeured car to pick Eunice up and bring her home. Instead of sitting in the back with her mom, Eunice sat in the front, next to the driver. When I picture Eunice, I just picture white knuckles. She's just constantly white knuckling everything. She's like fully engaged, but so anxious. Holding on for dear life. She was too one of those barefoot and dirty Kennedy kids. Unlike her older siblings, she often stayed at home while Joe Jr., Jack, and Kick went to dances out of the yacht club. She just didn't have that great of a time going out. But when she did have school dances... Many times, she would bring her little sister, Pat. She trusted her big brothers, Joe Jr. and Jack, to care for Rosemary while they were out. But at home, Teddy remembered that she was always behind or beside her, ensuring that, quote, Rosemary would have her fair share of successes at dodgeball, duck, duck, goose, or sailing. Eunice later said that Rosemary, quote, loved to be in the winning boat. Winning at anything always brought a marvelous smile to her face. Unlike Rosemary or Jack, Eunice was so tightly wound and riddled with anxiety, hence the white knuckling everything, that she had to use an eye mask and earplugs to even attempt sleeping. Guests were told not to flush the toilet at night because it would wake Eunice up. She was tall, lanky, could rarely ever sit still, competitive as any Kennedy, and the wonderful kids at school called her puny uni. From a very young age, she was the most Catholic next to Bobby, and she once told her best friend, Nancy Tenney, Listen, Ten, don't you think you ought to become a Catholic? <laughs> I could literally hear that coming out of Bobby's mouth as well. Uh-huh. Man, it's so same. aggressive. Yeah. Before sailing races, she would huddle everyone up and say, All right, now everyone say a Hail Mary. <laughs> Pat came next. She was a softer Kennedy. Still a Kennedy but not nearly as competitive as her brothers and sisters. She was athletically talented, but was more concerned with art and romance, how she may look playing tennis rather than beating all of her siblings. Pat was more enthralled with the dreams in her head and honestly, me too, Pat. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) Then we have Bobby. Quote, If he got a 77, he would argue for a 78 and not give up. He was remembered for that quality more than any other student in the history of this school. A priest from Bobby's school days remembered. Another story from school was that Rose loved to visit, and while she was at school, Bobby would show her all around, introduce her to everyone, but all the while knowing that every time she visited, he would have to deal with teasing and mocking from classmates after she left. Quote, Mrs. Kennedy's little boy Bobby is what they called him but he never stopped escorting his mom when she visited. He was later kicked out of said school when he took a quick look at a stolen exam that was being passed around and was caught and then immediately confessed. (laughs) Joe Sr. told him, Don't, I beg you, waste any time. And I'm not sure exactly what this quote means. I can't figure out what I think. It could mean something similar to how he talked to Rosemary, Jack, Joe Jr., And even telling Joe Jr., hey, tell Rosemary that she's not at school just to have fun. Make sure she remembers why she's there. It's great to have fun, but you also need to be studying. Could be that type of vibe. Or it could be, don't get discouraged. 
yes. don't mind getting caught at all. It's fine. Or getting kicked out. It's fine. Just keep moving forward. Move on. The Kennedy inheritance. The ability to not be got down. Yeah. Kind of like how he talked to Jack when he would not do well during his speeches. Right. And be super sad and downcast. Yeah. He's like, no, you did a good job. Just pick one thing you can improve. Yes. And actually, quite like his big brother, in Bobby's school days, he had his own Lem Billings, a lifelong friend that he met in school. And this is how that friend described Bobby from back in the day. Quote, I think we became friends right away. I think maybe my first impression of him was that we were both, in a way, misfits. I think he was a bit of a misfit because of coming in both late and also because of who he was. And so he didn't fit into Milton easily at that time. I think that was because his name was Kennedy and he was an Irish Catholic and Milton was basically an Anglo-Saxon wasp school. He also told a story of one Sunday that Bobby invited him to church because of course he did. And when the priest mentioned that they didn't have an altar boy for the service, Bobby jumped up and ran to the altar to serve. I was just thinking if Bobby's personality was the most like there from the beginning, like he just was who he was, who he was. But I feel like all of them Joe were like Jr., that. Yeah. Less so that they were just always that way. Cause I'm thinking, oh, it took me a long time to like grow into who I am. But I think it's the opposite. Like you're born who you are. And, and then people tell, tell you, to, you change. to be a different person. Yeah. They were never told to be a different person. <gasps> Crap. I can't. And think- I must burst into tears. <laughs> no, I can't think of the freaking Taylor Swift reference. She's like, um, oh, something yeah. Something about being seven, seven and uh-huh. screaming it's in the in the grocery store. In the aisle, yeah. There was no altar boy, and the priest said he needed somebody, so Bobby just got up and became an altar boy. From the moment I met him, I knew he would embarrass his friends. He would move into those situations where most of us would not. I think if anybody got in trouble, he would just instinctively move right into it, whereas most people are too afraid to be embarrassed, Dave said. He greatly respected Bobby for the fact that he was unwilling to compromise for others' approval. He refused to tell or even listen to dirty jokes, even as a middle school and high school boy. If anyone was ever getting bullied in any way, Bobby would immediately step in. Bobby was sensitive by nature, but he had to get tough quick when he was young, not only because of the family he was born into, where the runt always had to fight and where he struggled for recognition from his rugged big brothers, Joe Jr. and Jack, with so much distance and four sisters between them. Bobby wasn't a part of the OG Rat Pack from Brookline. He was a member of the second generation. So Bobby was the seventh Kennedy kid and definitely carried that quintessential middle child personality. He was a fighter. The other reason Bobby had to get tough was because of the amount of times he had to start over at a new school. Most of them were not his fault. From Brookline to Riverdale, then Bronxville, then to England and back to America— Bobby didn't have the natural charm of Jack, nor the athleticism of Joe Jr., nor the intelligence of either of them. Bobby did not impress girls. He did not win scholastic honors, nor the laughs of his classmates. What he did share with his brothers, the most important of all, was that thing Kick said was her one true inheritance as a Kennedy. The ability to not be got down. One teammate remembered, Bobby ran every practice play and tackled and blocked dummies as if he were in a hard-fought game. The kid had heart, and he never lost it. Next in the Sound of Music roll call... Brigitte. (laughs) No, but actually, Jean. She was the last sister, the youngest girl, often lost in the heap of all the others. But even at nine years old, Jean knew she was special. She was a Kennedy. She had picked up the habit of measuring her ankles and wrists, very proud of the iconic Kennedy slimness being so heavily bestowed upon herself. And in fact, she once told her younger cousin, Your ankles aren't thin enough to really be aristocratic. (laughs) She had been listening to Kick a bit too much. Jean is such, her and Teddy are both just quintessential little baby children. You can tell from a mile away that they are the youngest. Yep. Jean specifically matched her older sisters to a T any chance that she got. So Rose implemented this when they were little, had all the girls and boys in matching outfits. But Jean took this to a whole other (laughs) level and into her adulthood, she is matching Pat and Eunice in every photo. 
She wanted to be a Kennedy and she wanted to look like her siblings. And actually, on election night in 1960, the night we were talking about at the very beginning of this episode, Eunice and Jean and Joe Sr. were at the headquarters with Bobby early. So they're all huddled around the radio, listening intently, thinking about the election. Joe Sr. says, it looks like Jack's winning it easily. And then one of the campaign workers, John Droney, says suddenly, Eunice, you look like Jack. Eunice beamed. She took it as the highest compliment. A bit jealous, Jean then asked, John, who do I look like? (laughs) Bobby, he replied. Jean was devastated by this (laughs) and, quote, argued bitterly. She wanted to look like Jack, too. I love that they're full-grown women, mind you. They already (laughs) have their own children, and they're still such younger siblings. My big brother is the coolest person I've ever met, and to look like him, just to look like him, would be the highest compliment. Along with the tiny Kennedy ankles, she also inherited the Kennedy competitive spirit and athleticism. In the summer of 1937, nine-year-old Jean won five races, came in second 10 times, and third nine times at nine years old. And then last quote, his big brother's mascot, pampered by his big sisters, adored by his mother, spoiled by his father. Teddy. Trying to keep up on his chubby little legs. And yes, we will be talking about Chappaquiddick in the future. Teddy and Jean always, always had a friend to hang out with growing up because Rose made sure of it. There were plenty of other cousins their ages, and Rose had them staying at Hyannisport in shifts. Not just for the littlest ones, either. Each and every Kennedy kid had a relative staying with them every single week of every summer of their entire childhood so that they each always had a special friend. One would be assigned to Jean, one would be assigned to Pat, Jack had a friend assigned to him. The Kennedy kids doubled or tripled every summer. And Rose was incredible in this. She seriously cared about how her kids were going to grow up, what experiences they were having, who they were exposed to. But Rose wasn't doing this just for her kids. She also wanted her nieces and nephews to have wonderful experiences, friendships, and memories with their cousins in Hyannisport. She wanted them each to become the best humans they could be. And so Rose Kennedy personally paid for each and every one of them to go to private school for their entire education. Rose Kennedy had 45 nieces and nephews. I don't even understand how this is possible. So she's paying for the 45 nieces and nephews plus her nine kids. So she's paying for 50 Four schoolings, educations. To go to private school. Quote. Each of us was given between two weeks and a month at Hyannisport, whether we wanted it or not. Some of us were quite happy at home. But my mother was told, have Mary Lou ready on the 15th because she's coming down. Mary Louise McCarthy. She was the daughter of Loretta Kennedy, Joe Sr.'s sister. So she's Rose's niece through Joe's sister. Make sense? Got it. Rose knew she was a blessing and had blessings to bestow and the lessons to teach. When Mary Lou was seven, she was scheduled for her first trip to Hyannisport. Jean was eight months older than her and was a snot-nosed brat at the time. And Mary Lou was supposed to be Jean's special companion for the summer. I didn't like Jean at all. She remembered. There was no congeniality there. Somebody decided that Jean and I would play one another in tennis, and of course she beat me terribly. I just hated the whole darn thing. I was on the servant's back stairs sleeping, holding my teddy bear, and Bobby came thumping along and asked, What's the matter with you? He said. Well, Jean's a pest. I'll teach you. We'll show her. And so, for the next week, he gave me lessons, and then he told his sister that he had missed seeing the first marvelous match, and he would like to see us play again. Of course, she thought that was a wonderful idea. And of course, I licked her, and it was marvelous. Bobby came over and gave me a very darling boyish kind of halfway bear hug and said, We did it. We did it. That's good. Give it to her. That's fine. 
<laughs> and he had my total admiration forever. This is all from the oral history interview with Mary L. McCarthy, July 13th, 1977, Hyannisport, Massachusetts, by Sheldon Stern for the John F. Kennedy Library. So let's go back to the top of the interview because there are many more stories like this. Stern. How far back are we going? McCarthy. That's Mary Lou. Should I just say Mary Lou? Yes, say Mary Lou. Okay, (laughs) Mary Lou. Oh, let me see. Well, the first time I was aware of my big cousins and Joe and Jack really seemed like, you know, a duo. They were, I suppose, about in their last years of high school when I met them. I suppose they were like 17 and 18, 16 and 17, something like that. Well, the first time that I came to Hyannisport, Mother had arranged with Uncle Joe. He thought it would be good for all of us to begin to mix with our cousins. So Mother took me to the Esplanade and Uncle Joe and Dave, I can't remember Dave's last name, He was the chauffeur during those years. He picked us up, and I got in the car with my little blue suitcase and kissed Mommy goodbye, and off we went on this great, long drive down here. There were no highways then. You came through every little town on the Cape. It took forever, and Uncle Joe sat in the front and listened to Bo Carter and all the newsmen as we came along and chatted with Dave. Then when we got there, the butler, I can't remember which one it was, came out to meet us on the front porch, and Aunt Rose. The butler took the luggage, and Uncle Joe and Aunt Rose greeted one another, and then this enormous crowd of young people followed out the door, and I was simply, simply devastated. I hung on to Uncle Joe's leg and wanted to go in the house. That was it. Too much for me. I remember how tall Joe and Jack seemed. They seemed just massive, and it was sort of, they all seemed so tanned. I spent the summer in the water, too, outdoors in Winthrop. It's on the ocean also, but I was just freckled or burnt, and they all seemed wonderfully outdoorsy looking. She had met her Uncle Joe and Aunt Rose several times before this, but had not met many of the kids, and especially not all at once. And she's seven here? Yes. And she's an only child, right? Yeah, I don't know if that's in the interview, but I know that I looked that up, and she is an only child. So (laughs) A bit overwhelming. Yes. Quote. I had never seen all the children in mass and it just seemed so devastating. And the only way they could finally introduce me to them all is to put them up the stairs, the front stairs in the Hyannisport house, right in the central hall. So they were all mounted on the stairs and that was the easiest way. It just seemed like a mountain of children and I wanted to go home. (laughs) Stern. These weren't all Kennedy children. Actually, there probably were some additional relatives. Mary Lou. I think later on, yes, when I was able to figure faces out that some of the others had been brought in. I think that Joey Gargan was there, and Dave. The chauffeur's two little girls had come in by way of the kitchen and had joined the crowd. There were an awful lot of extra ones during the summers that followed. But my first meeting with them was just overwhelming because there were so many, and where I was an only child, it was just devastating. There you go. (laughs) I just wanted to go right home to mommy and daddy. I didn't want to stay down here at all. And then I was given in Jean's care, of course. You were always paired off with whoever was closest in age. So I can't remember much about the first few days, but then I became aware eventually that the older children never did anything at the same time we did, except once in a while eat. Because Aunt Rose had us on different schedules, time schedules, and everybody did things at different times. Then I realized that the main love of Joe and Jack seemed to be the ocean. They were always sailing. I love having her perspective of all of it because we've never gotten to see what the Kennedys were like through a kid's eyes, but I can't imagine how chaotic, overwhelming, intimidating that would have been. I mean, we know they were like aliens compared to other families. Like their peers and adults acknowledged Mm -hmm. this, but I can't imagine as a kid being... It's like in The Incredibles when he's like blowing the bubble on the tricycle. Oh my gosh, What are you yes. waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing, I guess. I love how Rose also acknowledged that there were two generations of Kennedy children. She's like literally scheduling them blocked off. Literally. The oldest and the youngest. Yeah, it's so interesting through Mary Lou's interviews, you get to see more insight to how they just operated on a normal basis yeah, in on their house. And it's wild. Wild. So she was saying that Jack and Joe Jr. were always sailing. Stern. 
Together, generally? Mary Lou. Usually together, yes. Sometimes we'd go down and see them as they came in. Joe was always seething if they had lost. He was always absolutely fanatical about whoever had cut them off at the last buoy, you know? Who had taken their wind or something. And I remember it seemed to me that Jack was not as competitive. I'm so, so sad. So interesting that, like, yes, he's so interested. I'm so sad. I just through a seven year old's eyes, like, she, this is just like an unfiltered observation. Yes. Yeah. No she one's was, telling she, her to think she these didn't know things. who they were or what. She was just observing. Jack and Joe were always together. It's also more evidence, like you said, that their personalities are not made up or exaggerated. All of their personalities were so obvious and so clear. cemented and clear and dramatic from the get-go. She's just watching them live life at their house. And in the summer too, she's getting like the actual family perspective. It's right. not, it's their- it's the off season. <laughs> yes, the off season. They're not having to perform for anyone at school uh-huh. or at church. They're at home at their house, just like hanging out and it's summertime and they're all relaxed. So it's the- They're being unfiltered. Themselves. Yes, it's the unfiltered version. And she went there every single summer from the age of seven to 16. So she got a wide range. It wasn't just like, oh, I went there for two weeks. This is what I saw. She interacted with them on a personal level lots of times. For years. And then she speaks of Kick. Quote. And I really think that she did more to start the brothers dating and to, you know, she would bring in glorious looking classmates or bring them back for the inspection of her handsome two brothers. Stern. Did you ever see her tease them about that? Mary Lou. Oh, constantly. It was nonstop. She was just terrible. I used to think that she probably spent half the night thinking up things to do to drive the two older brothers to madness. Stern. Can you think of any examples? Mary Lou. Well, there was. I don't know if Joe had, whether it was a convertible or a fliver or something that both of them used. I think it had a rumble seat. And she was always accusing them of finding the bobby pins and hairpins in it that must have belonged to a number of girls that she had not lined up for them. And she wanted to know, on the late dates, who they were taking home or who they were squiring and why were the bobby pins falling out of the hair? (laughs) What was going on? And, you know, they loved it. It was all good-natured and it was all delightful. They were wonderful with one another. I remember after about the third or fourth summer beginning to have a terrible longing to have brothers and sisters because I saw how much fun it could be together. Quote. They were golden years, probably too golden. Probably nobody had anything on their minds but Mr. Kennedy, who was setting their course, and he did. Nancy Tenney Coleman, whom Eunice thought ought to become a Catholic. And speaking of Eunice... When she remembered her childhood, she said, quote, There was so much to be thankful for. Everything was so wonderful most of the time. Most of our relationships were so wonderful within the family and with our parents. If you had a little problem, so what? That's what comes with a large family. It's a great advantage. You can see other people's problems and they don't complain. You don't see your mother complaining. My brother Jack was the same. He didn't complain, so what's to complain? I am absolutely dumbfounded by how in the world Rose was able to do this. And Joe too, that they are personally involved because it's one thing to just throw money at the, not Mm -hmm. problem, but like to feel like you're helping and you're the rich people in the family. And so it's your duty to pay for educations and whatever, but they are inviting them into their personal home where they are living and personally taking care of them, assigning them your children. Well, they're going the extra, extra, extra mile because- I think that even for, I mean, for anyone, but especially for busy, busy, busy people like they were, to it would be tempting to just send a chauffeur. You trust your chauffeur. He's a personal friend and he works with your family all the time. It's not like- And you'll greet them when they come. You'll be- Right. You'll be here when they get here. Yeah. It's one drive across the Cape. No, Joe Sr. literally personally gets in the car, goes, meets his sister, gets his- niece and rides with her. She only had to ride one way. He rode there and back yeah, just to go get her. And it was a long drive and they had to go through all the little tiny towns and he he can't work on his laptop or, you know, on his phone, be quote unquote productive like we are now. He couldn't multitask like that. He's just present. He's 
talking to his niece, talking to the chauffeur, listening to music, listening to the news. And if this is your one niece, okay, maybe. But how many kids did they do this for? 40, how many? 47, 45? 45. Joe Jr. and Jack and Cake always brought their friends to the Kennedy house. You know, that house on the block that everybody always goes to. Nobody ever goes to anybody else's house. You always go to that house. We were that house. We were that house. And that was the Kennedy house too. Lawrence Lemer explained that though the friends that came to visit usually were better athletes or more intelligent, they had a fierce loyalty and almost a subservient attitude toward even the younger Kennedy siblings. Joe and Jack and Kick's little brothers and sisters. They're like, you guys are awesome and I'm just getting to hang out with you. They were royalty, all of them. They each had such a passion for breathing and that was contagious. Even the babies were wise in that way and there was no question but to respect it. On bright, sunshiny days, the Kennedys spent all 16 waking hours under the blue sky at the beach, or in the grass. On cold, rainy days, they all huddled around and played Monopoly, 20 questions, or charades. Sometimes, Eunice and her friends would put on a play in the theater and charge admission. (laughs) In the evenings, Rose made sure to, quote, fix the menu so that there were things to fatten up the skinny ones and slim down the chubby ones. According to cousin Mary Lou, the Kennedys were always split right down the middle in that arena. And Rose was always trying to balance the scales. A detail only a mother would care about. After dinner, Joe Sr. would show the newest movie in the theater before it even came out and would stand up and yell for the projectionist to stop the film if there was anything inappropriate and then waited patiently while all Kennedy kids, <clears throat> Sound of Music kids, what's their last name? <laughs> Von Trapp kids shuffled out and then play the movie watch the scene, and then he'd stop the movie again, let them know when they can all come back in. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what a sacrifice time-wise, money-wise. You're spending all of this, all of these resources on kids that aren't even your own. It seems so exhausting to me Mm -hmm. and like such a sacrifice. And for them, it was almost energizing. Like they really, truly, genuinely loved to do it. They were happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And they felt useful and they felt prideful in the fact that they and were had able, fun. able to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think Joe genuinely enjoyed chatting with the chauffeur on the yeah. way. Like he wanted a friend to hang out with. You can see that too in how they set their kids up with their nieces and nephews. Everyone needed a person. Like everyone needed mm-hmm. a companion. Yeah. And they valued relationships so much and so much. fun as well. And there's more little anecdotes and stories about Rose coming up because in my mind, she's so buttoned up and strict. Can't even breathe hardly can't even be a human, but she did. She did. And she had fun. And she, she even said herself. And I think episode two, we talked about going out of her way to make sure that the kids could play practical jokes, could talk about anything, could have fun during their day. And uh, you see some of those personal stories from Mary Lou that show that in Rose. Other evenings, Rose would sit at the piano and play old songs. Everyone would gather around And allegedly, every family member had a special talent to never hit a correct note, (laughs) but always with the utmost fervor. This reminds me of in Kick's episode when Joe Jr. and her put on the Christmas party and they were singing and playing the piano. And then also in Rosemary's story, she made that special friend in Wisconsin And people speculated that that was exactly why she attached herself to that friend and loved her so much because that friend played piano. And so it reminded Rosemary of her childhood and just took her back home. Rose was especially protective of her girls. When any of the girls, Kick, Eunice, Pat, or Jean, were late from a date or a party, Rose would get in her car and immediately head out looking for her. As soon as the late Kennedy girl saw headlights... They knew that it was their mom's little blue car. And as soon as she said, dear, it's time to come home. No matter which of them it was, there was no arguing. They said goodbye and hopped in. The next morning, whichever daughter it was would just find a little note on their pillow that said, the next time, be sure to be in on time. When anyone says the anything, why are the bobby pins falling out of the hair? 
the next time, be sure to be in on time. It just sends me. I love it. (laughs) And of course, that note was always in their mother's handwriting. It seems like they all respected her so much and took her so seriously that she didn't have to be super strict. More evidence of that is when she took a nap in the middle of the afternoon, all of the kids, even the babies, would tiptoe and whisper. And I don't think that it's even just that they respected her and knew she meant business Mm -hmm. in a way. I think they also loved her, loved her and liked her Mm -hmm. so much. Both Joe Sr. and Rose, they adored them and they were so grateful that it was like, well, it's the least I can do. You know what I mean? They wanted to be helpful. They wanted their parents to think highly of them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because Rose could totally hang, and I don't know why she gets this bad rap, but listen to these stories. So one of Jack's friends remembered that every time he visited the Kennedy house, he would always be introduced to Rose by a different name. It was just a joke that they had ongoing. And every single time, Rose would formally throw out her hand for a shake and introduce herself as if she had never met this person before in her life. When Jesse originally read the script, I did not understand that this that Rose was in on the joke. I thought that she literally didn't because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there's literally yeah, so 50 many kids people. coming mm-hmm. in and out every single summer. How would you even know? No, she totally knew. Yeah, she wasn't rude. She didn't literally not understand that she had met this person before. It, it's a joke. She and was playing along. More evidence that it was a joke and it was Rose's personality was that when Bobby, he had gotten a little older and he went to Europe for a long trip. And when he got back, obviously, he's excited to see his family. He's excited to see his mom. Bobby and Rose had a really sweet relationship. And he was expecting a warm greeting from her. But he walked in. Rose just brushed past him and casually asked, hey, have you seen Jack? And Bobby just got home from this long Europe trip. He's like, (laughs) (laughs) acknowledge me. I need fanfare here. And it's just a it's Another just a joke. joke. She's just like poking fun because she knew he, was, he waiting. was waiting for her to be like, oh my gosh, Bobby. And she's like, oh, hey, have you seen Jack? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind you. But as we know, it was not all fun and games or warm memories. Rose reflected later in life that the younger kids had so much tragedy so early on in their lives that they probably didn't have as many happy childhood memories as the older kids did. Quote, Jean was about 16 when we lost our son, and all these tragedies started. And so Jean probably didn't have as much joy in her life at 16 as perhaps some of the others had. When Pat was 13 years old, she was rushed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital for an emergency appendectomy, and Rose was in Paris. Pat was terrified and incredibly lonely. Joe Sr. was in Washington, D.C., and she was being wheeled into an operating room by herself. Oh my gosh. This is actually the origin story of one of our characters from Rosemary's episodes. That night, the hospital called one of their nurses in to help with Pat's emergency surgery. She had been working nights for a month and was worn out, this nurse. But when she heard that it was a little girl and she was all alone without her parents, she said she would come. It was Luella Hennessy. Just after Pat's operation, while she was still in the hospital, 11-year-old Bobby was brought in with pneumonia. Rose was on her way back from hearing about Pat. She got on a, probably a ship or something. A boat, (laughs) plane, I don't know. something, I don't know. Train. But she was on her way back, but she was still days away. And so in the hospital, Bobby and Pat were each other's comfort. And they both grew especially fond of Miss Luella Hennessy. Quote, Patricia was such a lovable, beautiful child and so grateful for the smallest thing I did for her. Clouds of chestnut hair emphasized the blue of her wide, trusting eyes, and sick as she was, she seemed like one of the happiest little girls I had ever known. Her smile was almost perpetual. Luella. When Rose finally got back from France, Bobby and Pat were still both in the hospital, and she asked each of them to choose the nurse that would come home with them to Hyannisport to watch over them while they fully recuperated. They discussed the appointment amongst themselves and agreed that Miss Luella would be the one they would like to accompany them. I love that Rose let them choose. I know. Rose had but one question. Do you smoke? (laughs) She didn't know Luella yet, but... She trusted her children. 
She was Catholic. She didn't smoke. And she was there for Pat and Bobby when their mother couldn't be. So that was that. She'd come home with them if she'd like to. She agreed. And then Joe Sr. asked her to please not wear makeup. (laughs) What in the world? (laughs) And the rest is history. They brought her home and she became one of Rosemary's most trusted and warm friends. And she stayed with Rosemary through the trip to England and all kinds of things. Was always by her side. Yes. And that was all thanks to Pat and Bobby. 15-year-old Pat, so two years later, was a bit too smart for her own good. She was too young to run around with Kick and Eunice, and she was much more shy than both of them were naturally. But it had come time for her to follow in their footsteps and attend Norton Sacred Heart Boarding School. Pat did not agree with this plan for her life. She had heard plenty from Eunice and Kick to know that she needed to do anything within her power to change her fate, stay home, and avoid Norton. So she came up with a plan. She would just purposely put a few wrong answers on her entrance exam and fail the test. Then what could her mother say? She wasn't accepted. She was successful. She stayed home and attended Maplehurst, another Sacred Heart school. So it's like the same same type of environment, but this one was only a 15-minute ride from home on the edge of the Bronx, and at the school, she'd be attending alongside Jean. She had to start the year by repeating sophomore classes. No way. But miraculously, within two weeks, she had remembered all that she had seemingly forgotten before. But, quote, By then, Mother had decided it was too late to send me off to Sacred Heart at Norton. In fact, I never went to boarding school until college. I never told her what I had done. Oh my gosh. She changed her in the entire trajectory of her life. Of course, it was a similarly strict school. It was still a Sacred Heart location. But this way, she could go home and be with her family on the evenings and weekends. And Bobby and Teddy were also just attending day school at the time. So they were at home on the evenings and weekends. And plus... Now, even at school, she always had Jean. It's interesting. I wonder, because Pat was not super shy. Really, I mean, she wasn't shy. She wasn't Eunice or Kick, but she, like, went out and was in the (laughs) Hollywood scene and liked socializing a lot. I wonder if middle kids are the kids who, like, don't want to leave home. Because you always wanted to be homeschooled, too. You were like, I'd rather hang out with my sisters. Maybe, though, because the oldest, they don't, like, realize that they have an option. <laughs> Maybe and that's what it the is. the youngest, the oldest are already gone. So the uh-huh. youngest are like, okay, well, I want to be gone, too. Yeah, and the they don't want to stay like, home by themselves. But I still, yeah. Yeah, I the middle kids, the there's, like, sissies. people to hang out with. Uh-huh. That's That has to be why. So, for Pat well worth it. Jean's first year in college, she attended Manhattanville Sacred Heart, as her sisters had, and at 17 was paired with a roommate called Ethel Skakel. (laughs) Ethel had two soulmates, Bobby and Jean. Kennedy. (laughs) Did you guys know this? (laughs) Two Kennedys. I love it. I love it. The entrance of Ethel Skakel Mm. to the Kennedy bloodline. This was a friendship for the ages. They were as inseparable as the rigorous rules of the college permitted, finishing each other's sentences, laughing at the mere suggestion of their friend's joke, attesting to the virtue of the other to all who would listen. They just understood each other, and they would talk about each of their families endlessly. Ethel was the second to the youngest of seven Skakel children, and Jean was the second to the youngest of nine Kennedy children. A match made quite literally in heaven. Ethel's mom was an Irish Catholic. Her dad was a Dutch Protestant. And the Skakel family also had a fortune. But the Skakels did not quite have the discipline nor feel the divine calling that the Kennedys felt. Instead, they were of the thought, what was money if not to be spent? (laughs) What was wealth if not to be flaunted? Which explains her issue in KFM 11, a true misunderstanding. Here is Lawrence Lemer. 
Although at first hearing Jean and Ethel's childhood recollections sounded similar, the Skakels appeared like the Kennedys blown up to cartoon-like size, where the young Kennedys' friends found something inspiring and inevitable in the intrepid, adventurous young scions. The Skakels' friends often found the Skakel family, quote-unquote, scary. Oh. He said that, of course, the Kennedys sailed daringly, but even they knew to come in when the weather got nasty. They still wanted to live, after all. The Skakels knew no such limits. Ethel's brothers, quote, swung from the trees on the estate like a race of Tarzans. They tied Ethel up on the end of a rope and swung her from the second story window of their house. And one of their favorite games was called King of the Castle, in which one of the boys would stand on top of the the roof of the car while the rest of them were inside the car. And they would drive around looking for low branches to try to knock the brother on the top of the car off. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. To knock the king off of the castle. When unassuming guests would come by their house, they'd give them a regular old tour of the estate in the car and then end it by a surprise, quote, roller coaster like ride down the hill and into the middle of a pond. <gasps> in the car? <laughs> yes. Literally just drive people straight into the middle of a pond. I suppose the others are <laughs> wild. <laughs> Jean was one of the more subdued Kennedy kids. Ethel was a roller coaster personified. And she drug Jean down and up and around the loops of life with her. Together, they were pranksters. A pair of preppy posh punks. <laughs> they hyped each other up and were absolutely out of control. One night at Sacred Heart, the girls were all discussing and pondering what the nuns might wear to bed. Ethel said, you know what? There's one way to find out. She runs into the hallway, pulls the freaking fire alarm, and of course, all of the Sacred Heart mothers rushed out of their rooms in their nightgowns. Ethel was wild. But Jean could hang too. One night, she was upset because she couldn't leave campus for a big date that she had because of all of her marks in the demerit book. Quote, This is ridiculous to ground us at this age. We're too old to be grounded. So she decided that she would sneak the book with all of her demerits inside of it out of the office and toss it down the incinerator chute, freeing them from their marks and from campus. And this story might be my favorite. Actually, this one is. (laughs) This one's my favorite. So Ethel one day saw Monsignor Hardigan arrive for his visit to the school in a fancy new Cadillac. Ethel found this incredibly irresponsible and a little bit inappropriate, hypocritical. So she wrote him a nice little note and fastened it right to the middle of his windshield that said, Are the collections good, father? (laughs) So much. I love it. He was so pleased with being called out that he shut the school down for several days until Ethel finally came forward and claimed her nice little note. You know that Kennedy contradiction that we talked about in KFM 10 where we were saying everything within the Kennedy family was so backwards and contradictory, but it like made sense within the Kennedy family, but only in the Kennedy family. Yes. Ethel had that too. In most secular colleges, Ethel's behavior would have gotten her expelled. But the mothers of Sacred Heart knew how deeply religious Ethel really was full of not only mischief, but religious joy. She became a child of Mary at Manhattanville and was considering becoming a nun as an expression of her faith. Lucky for Bobby, she She did did not. not. (laughs) But at Harvard, where Bobby was attending at the time, they lectured and taught about social issues. But at Manhattanville, where Jean and Ethel attended, they spent several hours each week in settlement houses and in hospitals serving alongside their learning about such issues. And one of the issues that they discussed at Manhattanville was the lack of racial justice in America. And a lot of the students actually took the issue to the streets, including Ethel's older sister, who, this story is really cool, 
also, she was named Pat as well, Patricia. So there was a Patricia Kennedy, Pat Kennedy, and a Pat Skakel as well. So during this time, even though we think of New York City as a very progressive place, this is the mid to late 40s, early 50s, and it was still very, very segregated. And so Black Americans would rarely venture below Harlem until Pat and a Black student, her friend, went out to lunch together and single-handedly desegregated one of the most popular restaurants in Midtown Manhattan called Schraff's, quote, effectively desegregating the popular restaurant in one fell swoop. Mic drop. Also, before Bobby dated Ethel, he dated Pat, her oh, sister. my gosh, I forgot about this. Her sister. Obviously, it would have been a much too serious pairing. Little alter boy Bobby needed roller coaster Ethel, <laughs> so it worked out perfectly, but isn't that crazy? Well, obviously, we'll have to hear that story. Like Bobby, Jack also very much appreciated Ethel. The way that she could be so serious about the mission and the purpose of her life, but never take herself too seriously. And of course, he was also a wild card, would do many things for a laugh, and had his own rap sheet of pranks against the staunchness of Catholic private school long before Ethel or Jean had any such ideas. Here's another story from Cousin Mary Lou. Stern. Can you think of any examples of his sense of humor you saw him do? Mary Lou. Well, the only other one. He had been writing his early speech, and it was here in Hyannisport. And I suppose it was before he started Congress, and he was all pleased with it, and he had come in from bathing. And usually the boys showered downstairs and put a towel on and came upstairs to their rooms and changed, if they hadn't had sense enough to bring the things downstairs. Aunt Rose preferred everybody change downstairs, but sometimes they marched around in towels. And his sisters were all there, and they were kind of teasing him and giving him a hard time about, you know, who wants you for a congressman? And so he said, listen, I have a marvelous speech that will overwhelm you with its intelligence. <laughs> so he gave a speech like Caesar in his towel amidst all of us with catcalls and, you know, anybody that skinny will never be elected for anything because he was just bones at the time. So we gave him a very hard time and he loved it. He just howled and said, pay no attention to the rabble and the riffraff and I will achieve no matter what. So that was kind of fun. Actually, I didn't see him much after that. We moved south, and I just didn't see him until the inauguration, so there was a lot of years in between. In January 1947, so 13 years before the presidential election, Eunice followed in her older sister Kick's footsteps and traveled with Jack to Washington, D.C. She moved in with her older brother into a three-story townhouse on 34th Street in Georgetown. This is the one that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. This is also the very same neighborhood that Kick spent all of those very interesting evenings with a certain John White of the Times Herald. Mm -hmm. And Inga Arvid. And Inga. Eunice and Jack brought their longtime housekeeper, Margaret Ambrose, with them. And we've mentioned also that Bill Sutton roomed with them. He was one of Jack's campaign aides from Boston. But Eunice was not moving to Washington with Bill and Margaret and Jack to become a secretary or, I don't know, write up fun articles at the Times Herald like <laughs> Kathleen had. <laughs> Eunice would not be spending her precious time on anything that anyone else could do. We talk so much about what Joe Sr. thought of his sons and what he expected of them, but Joe never overlooked Eunice. If that girl had been born with balls, she would have been a hell of a politician. And so he had seen to it that Eunice would be the most important 25-year-old woman at the nation's capital. It sucks that Joe was right. We talked about this a little bit in KFM 11, but if she would have run, she still wouldn't have been elected because it was 19, what, 47, 50. Yeah, and no one would have voted for her. So unfortunately... It was true. But also, we may not have had the Special Olympics, so. This is one of those interesting moments in which Kick and Eunice, born only one year apart, 
seemed to have lived in alternate universes, or at the very least, separate generations. John White of the Times Herald newspaper, our beloved and infamous Kicks John White, was now back at his desk writing the Did You Happen to See column that Inga and Kick had both written before. And in early 1947, while Kick was in Europe flirting with one Peter Fitzwilliam, this is just before her death. So this really feels like a different world. John White wrote an article about Eunice. And he said, quote, She is a pretty girl with big blue eyes, which sparkle as big blue eyes should. She also has mahogany brown hair, a merry smile, and quick, engaging ways. Very attractive. Eunice Mary Kennedy is energetic and ambitious with a lot of her old man's ability. She has that Irish enthusiasm and enjoyment of life. She is serious about her work and conscious of its importance, but doesn't let it get her down. It is fascinating, she says. Right now, she finds, there is hardly time enough to get through it all, but keeping busy as a bee comes fairly naturally to a Kennedy. (laughs) John White of the Times Herald. This is crazy, too, to think that, I think it was in one of Kick's episodes, you quote Jack saying, one day I hope to be as... First, I was known as Joe Kennedy's son. Mm-hmm. Then Kick's sister. Then, then you. Or, well, I guess Kick's brother, right? Yeah. <laughs> then, then Kick's, Kick's brother, brother. Then Eunice's, Eunice's brother. brother. I hope to one day stand, stand on, on my, my own. own two feet. Yeah. <laughs> and this is like around that same time. I guess, yeah. It's just interesting to like weave all the stories together and all the different timelines yep. and see what, where each individual Kennedy was at, but then also the like main timeline where they all fit in together. Red strings everywhere. Even when looking at how Ethel comes into the picture. I'm I'm excited to tell that story. The red string connections. Jack and Eunice were of two very different personalities, but one mind. The infamous story of their 31st Street home was that it always looked like a fraternity house. (laughs) The rugs were always scrunched up in the corner as if someone was running through and flung it behind. (laughs) And there was always more clothes on the floor and hung over the chair than there were in the closet. One night, Joseph Alsop, a columnist, arrived for a dinner party at the Kennedy residence in Washington, D.C., where no one is ever late. There were no Kennedy members to be found. (laughs) This gave him plenty of time to have a little look around, and this is the time that the rotten, quote, ancient leavings of a hamburger behind some books was discovered on Jack and Eunice's fireplace mantle. Oh my gosh. Jack wore mismatched socks and ties with food stains. Eunice wore pantyhose with rips in them and skirts that were clearly never ironed. Jack had a weak stomach and Eunice's wasn't much better, so they lived on tomato soup and creamed chicken. Eunice was in a, quote, perpetual state of emotional disarray running late for meetings, dictating letters and memos to her frenzied assistant, full of such frantic urgency as if all life were on a deadline. Because for them, it was. People were out there. People who needed help. And who else was going to help them? Several nights a week, Eunice brought home, quote, troubled girls for dinner not sociological case studies, but adolescents she was trying to help. On Sunday evenings, she would gather 15 or 20 girls from a local girl's home, most of whom were in trouble with the law, and told them, we want you to be happy children. Happy children become happy men and women. Sometimes, Jack had as much passion as Eunice did. But most of the time, she drug him along. And sometimes... He made sure not to be home around dinner time. (laughs) Quote. It's fair to say that then I was more concerned with social problems than Jack. Eunice admitted. He was challenged mentally and emotionally by it, but he wasn't running around concerned with things such as housing for the poor. His early years, he was more of a searcher. He wasn't totally engrossed in what he was doing. Yet. That's the type of stuff that we haven't gotten to really dive into that I'm sad about it, but... 
It's we'll just have to do many sounds. So much more convincing that there's so many stories. Incredible secret stories. That's secret the thing. Stories. You don't find them until you find random interviews from cousin Mary Lou, and then you're like, wait a second, what's going on? They're even better than I thought. Yeah. The Kennedy girls were pioneering so much in these days. There's so much more to discuss, but once it was time to back Jack, they all dropped what they were doing to stand behind their big brother. That's cool too, to think about their sacrifice because we mentioned Bobby's sacrificing his career right. for the sake of his brother, but mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about Eunice's career being put on hold. Right. And Pat. And they were all so happy to do it. Yeah. Oh, because he loved his brother. <laughs> I died. They were also standing behind what he was doing, what they believed he was going to do. Jean was the most shy Kennedy girl, the most shy Kennedy, and the least naturally skilled for a political career. She was the first to get on a train to Massachusetts and begin working for Jack. It was, quote, endlessly difficult being polite to people I didn't know, always having to be wary, alert, running, always running. She reflected. You never meet anyone you can really talk to. You meet people very superficially and constantly. After four or five months, you get into the routine, but it's never easy. Jack knew how difficult it was for Jean, and he never forgot her willingness to be useful. On the night that he won the election, he gifted to his baby sister a signed photograph, quote, To Jean, don't deny you did it. John Kennedy. (laughs) In true Jean fashion, she said about the photograph, It was a joke. Mm. (laughs) But even she knew what a difference the Kennedy sisters made. In 1960, there were over 3 million more voting age women than men. It was evident that Jack's success or failure would be more than partially decided by how he did in the eyes of America's women. Jackie accused her sisters-in-law of being more so for themselves than for progress. Quote, They adore Jack and would do anything to get their names in print. She told Joseph Alsup, the one who found the ancient hamburger. (laughs) But Peter Dougal argued that, quote, As hard as the girls worked, it might not have really been politically a gain proposition, but it was giving them exposure. That's something that they needed. Unlike Jackie, who stayed home after she had her babies, which is reasonable, Jean and Ethel popped them out and were back on the campaign trail, smiling, shaking hands, and collapsing in hotel rooms within weeks. It would help to have your best friend out there with you, though. Ethel and Jean. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) Especially your prank-loving best Uh, friend. A little entertainment. And I'm sure that also made Jackie feel more left out. Exactly. There's always more context. But Lawrence Lemer recognized that maybe the Kennedy sisters collected their newspaper appearances because it was the most tangible evidence of the help that they were giving their brother. Oh, yes. They just wanted acknowledgement. Yeah. They They wanted to know, is what I'm doing helping? Is it doing anything? Mm -hmm. And when they would appear in the press, that was tangible evidence. Yeah. And you're proud of helping your big brother. And the whole family. And in their eyes... America. Yes, the and citizens. The world. <laughs> and the world. <laughs> and freedom for all. <laughs> Quote. I'm crazy about Jack and I'm only an in-law. Ethel shared. Oh, I just love her. I know. I'm not here because Bobby or Jack asked me to be. I believe in Jack's courage and integrity and I feel I'm a better person for having known him. Aren't we all? <laughs> Rose at the time said that she was sorry Jackie hadn't been able to join them, quote, but the girls have gone out and tried to pick up the slack. (laughs) (gasps) To a reporter? Uh, Yep. She's too honest. Rose Kennedy. (laughs) After the election ended, Eunice collapsed. She was admitted to Boston Hospital and stayed in their care for a week. Quote, She was like a mechanical toy, wound up so tightly 
that it almost exploded with tension. Oh my gosh, Eunice. Talk about white knuckling life. It was also during this time period that it was discovered that like Jack, Eunice also had Addison's disease. Oh my gosh, this family. So she was doing all of that in massive amounts of pain. And it wasn't even for her. My brother Jack didn't complain. So why complain? Oh my gosh, wow. Wow. She does all of that. And then she goes on to freaking start Camp Shriver and yep. then the Special Olympics and then literally works until the day she dies. Yep. The Kennedys don't believe in retirement, by the way. By the way, if you didn't catch already on. catch yeah. that. The Kennedy girls took everything they had and gave it as a sacrifice. They didn't just host tea parties. They showed up in poodle skirts that said John F. Kennedy across the front. The Kennedy boys gave just as much. Quote, There wasn't any jealousy because in a big family, everybody has a different kind of talent. And if somebody is good at one thing, then somebody else is better at another. Eunice Kennedy. And maybe that was it. The reason they got along was because they each had their own place. Or maybe it was also because instead of staring at each other, picking apart the stray hairs and annoying habits, they were standing side by side, all looking in the same direction, running together. Because the Kennedy family was on a mission. And so, at 9.30 in the morning, on the day after the endless night that was the 1960 presidential election, when they all found out that they had done it, that their big brother, was the next president of the United States. They celebrated together, just as they had fought together. And then they all took a nap. It was a job well done, but no Kennedy member was done. They were just getting started. They were at the helm during the most turbulent moment in American history. The rumors are legion. Some sincere, some slander. They gave everything to their country. But what did it look like behind closed doors, in their homes, the most intimate moments of their time on Earth? Sometimes the truth is more wild than the headlines. They seemed to live the easy life, but they lost it all in an instant. They ran faster, worked harder, burned brighter, and then they were gone. You have just listened to The Kennedy Siblings, episode 13 from Blood and Business. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. The main source for this episode was The Kennedy Women by Lawrence Lemer and the John F. Kennedy Library. To see a complete list of sources for all Blood and Business episodes, head on over to Patreon for a free PDF download. 